نبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الحزن اذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين uh, We have chosen uh, a book from the Ihya علوم الدين of Imam Al-Ghazali رحمة الله عليه uh, I think personally it's a very very important chapter to, uh, to study because of the immense uh, influence that uh, uh, the media has upon us and uh, what the West, not only the West, but what this dunya has opened for us of uh, means of communication with one another. Uh, we have to remember that our Prophet ﷺ was a man of very few words, very few words, but rather he was a man of action. It was a man of action. And uh, even though there are many recorded a hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these words is nothing in comparison to the amount of words if one were to accumulate the words of an ordinary person from the age of 40 upward till he dies at the age of 63. The amount of words that we let out, that we speak, that we say it's, it's much, much, much more than that of the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mankind was initially not created to converse with the tongue, even though, even though the tongue is a means to take somebody to higher degrees through the dhikrullah, uh, through saying La ilaha illallah perhaps could take somebody from kufr into Islam or perhaps it could, can take somebody from Islam into kufr but mankind his uh, mode of conversation was spiritual when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Adam alayhi salam all the names and all the words. It was all spiritual. It was all spiritual. The conversation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has with his servants. I'm talking here about the angels and I'm talking here about uh, the anbiya. It's not, a, it's not a word. It's not a tongue conversation. The conversation is a rather spiritual. So when Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam came to the earth, his speech was more spiritual. Right? Even ourselves, when we sit in front of one another, 90% of our, of our words is unspoken. There's body language. There's facial expression. There's the tone of the voice and all of these things are saying things before you are letting out your verbs and your pronouns and your and your nouns okay before you say something already there's a meaning that resonates from you that that, that, that transcends or trans that you transmit from yourself to somebody else okay so the more spiritual somebody is sometimes you can feel you can feel the spirituality of somebody just by sitting in his company. And that is the type of conversation that we are, that we are, that we are in dire need of. Is that, that hal, it speaks to one another. And this is how Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam spoke to creation. Until Sayyidina Idris alayhi salam came, it was commanded for him that he used the pen. And it was commanded for him that he use his tongue to guide mankind. Right? So, uh, why did this happen? This happened because the arwah that uh, receives the signals of another person became dusky, it became muddled up, it became weak, it became dark, 
and the heart that normally receives these signals, now the signals rebound from the heart because the heart has become hard. So we can't read one another's states without even saying a word. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or other Imam Ghazali mentions in another chapter, the chapter of Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahani Munkar, Imam Ghazali says if a man who is a pious man walks into a room of a hundred criminals and there's one pious man, he will go and sit next to the pious man. Have you experienced something like that before? You go into the bus, you look around and you see somebody and you go and sit next to him. It turns out that that person and you, you have lots of things in common. This is the arwah that speaks to one another. And similarly, when, when a criminal comes into a room with a group of pious men, right? And there's one criminal sitting in that group. He will go and sit next to the criminal. Subhanallah. This is the arwah speaking to one another. Now, that particular state has been so much muddled up because of the amount of media that we take in. And the, 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 the means of conversation that we are engaged with on a daily basis, Twitter, Facebook, text, email, you know, we are constantly in a mode of talking, not knowing what we are saying. Right? And uh, this type of conversation was brought in at the time of Sayyidina Idris and perhaps before that, because the arwah became dark, it could not receive one another's ruhani signals and ruhani kalam. Okay? That is what we want to reinstall. But it's going to be very difficult if you're not going to start cut off. Cutting off, there has to be a cutting off point from these, uh, uh, this, this media messaging, if you, if you, if you like. It's a, um, it's, <laughs> there's no root to our words. No? The khatib who speaks on the mimbar, nowadays the khatib's words is not even connected to his heart. To his heart let alone the words of the, the ordinary Muslim in the street. So there has to be meaning to our words. Al mar'u bi asgharihi. A man is what his two lower organs are all about. What is the, lo the, the, the lower organs or the smaller organs? Al lisanu wal qalb. His tongue and his heart. Not only his tongue. A man, al mar'u bi asgharihi. A man is what his two smaller organs is. Meaning that what his tongue utters and what is in his heart, that is the man. And you can tell what type of man it is. Is he a dunyawi person? Is he a person that cares for other people? You can all tell that by what comes out of his mouth. Okay? So it is important for us to, to sort of link our words up with our ruh. And when we talk about the ruh here, yeah, we talk about the heart because the ruh and the heart is synonymous. Or the soul, the, the, the nafs, and the, and the heart is synonymous. So we need to have some sort of connection. Our words has to carry meaning and has to have substance. This is what, you know, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa taught us. Okay? So Imam Ghazali's topic tonight is actually argumentation and debate. Argumentation and debate. And this is a very important topic because it is because of this topic that we have the amount of fragmentation in our ummah today is because of not seeing eye to eye which leads eventually to argumentation and argumentation leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking out the mercy and the rahmah from the communities and that is what we, ca we can't afford that we can't afford Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to turn his back on us. We are in such a very weak state. Even though, even though we are still chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these calamities and all of these trials and tribulations that we are seeing, all of that is a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this ummah. The ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't ever forget this, is a chosen ummah. It is the chosen ummah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to believe that. Don't let we turn our backs on ourselves and our deen and our prophet and on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us because he loves us. 
right? So these calamities that come, <coughs> that, that befalls upon us, it all stems from weak communication. And weak communication leads to argumentation. And argumentation, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, ما ضل قوم بعد بعد الهدى إلا أوت الجدل There's no community and there's no people that has been given guidance and then guidance has been taken away from them and they went astray except the reason for that was that they started arguing amongst one another. Subhanallah, they started arguing amongst one another. Remember the hadith of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Sunan Abu Dawud, Imam, Imam Abu Dawud as Sajistani relates this hadith of Sayyidina Abu Huraira. People used to argue about <coughs> about where, about the, the, uh, the night of Laylatul Qadr. And because of the argumentation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it away and left it uh, for us to find. Okay? And similar uh, calamities will, will come upon us just because of argumentation. And the previous nations, the reason why they went astray was also because of argumentations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions many a times in the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given ilm to the Ahlul Kitab. Naam. Illa min ba'dima atahumul ilm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps on repeating in the Quran that these two, these two nations, they are both a Jewish nation. Right, the ones we know is the Christians, the others are the Jews. But they actually uh, separated from one another because of an argumentation about Jesus, about Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Now, so they, they went astray after Allah subhanahu has given them knowledge. And the knowledge according to the Mufassirun is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them knowledge about Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is where the argumentation starts. Some of them said, well, he's our prophet. And the Jews said, no, he's our prophet. He's sent to us. He's coming to us. And the, the, the Christians said, no, he's coming to us. And eventually, we had two major fractions of the Abrahamic religion. Major fractions because of an argumentation. And this is after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them knowledge. Now the same year, the Muslims, they have the ilm, they have the knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the Qur'an. But still, they have separated. Okay, it happened before with the Jews and the Christians. So this particular topic is extremely important. And Imam Ghazali gives us a, what Imam Ghazali does normally is he gives us steps on how to, how to control our tongue when it comes to argumentation and when it comes to debate. And Imam Ghazali's way of, uh, of explaining these things is uh, by telling us how the Salaf al-Saliheen used to behave with one another. Now we have, you know, the greatest of the greatest of mentors to teach us, not only in word, but they lived it. They lived this particular life of how to, uh, um, when, they, when they differ from, or with one another, they, they, they had a sense of compromise. For example, Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, wa radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he differed with Sufyan al-Thawri, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, another sahib al-madhab, who had a madhab of his own, and Imam al-Shafi'i had a madhab of his own. And both of them, they were giants and, and, and mountains of knowledge. Okay. The two came together to argue, not to argue, but to debate a mas'ala. The mas'ala was, is the skin or the hide of a, of a sheep, a dead sheep, a dead animal, an edible animal that is. Okay. Is it halal for a Muslim to make use of it? Imam al-Shafi had the opinion that it's not halal. And Imam, Abu Sufi, Imam uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, his opinion was, it is halal, it is permissible, you can make use of it. And both of them had their opinions. 
based on Dalil. They went into the room and they had a discussion, they had a debate, weighing the evidence, the strength of the evidence, checking the, san the asaneed and checking the means of extrapolation from the hadith. The outcome was that Imam al-Shafi'i ended up taking the opinion of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri and al-Thawri took the opinion of Imam al-Shafi'i. Not only did these people speak, but when it came to putting things to practice, they were people of amal, of action. Not only that, but Imam Abu, uh, Imam, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, this is what he said. One day people called him and said, you know, Ya Imam Al-Adam, we've got an issue. We've got two Imams here. They are about to lead for us now. Okay, it's a jama'ah in the masjid, in Kufa. They've got two Imams. The, one of them has a bid'ah. They believe in something. It was a mu'tazili. Believed in that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam is created. And Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, we don't say that. So that is a bid'ah. And uh, the other one, he was of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. He agreed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam, Allah's divine speech is uncreated. So the people said, well, mashallah, you know. But the two had a debate just before Imam Abu Hanifa came in. This is why they called him. So the question was, they said, Ya Imam Al-A'zam, who do we stand who do we follow? These two are both Imams. Who do we follow? Imam Abu Hanifa, what was his answer? He said, you can't follow any one of them. You got a shock. It's a Sunni. And there's a Muqtadiyah. Okay? He said, you can't follow any one of them. Yeah, they said, uh, explain, you know, understand this, per this person is, is committing a bid'ah. We can't follow him. But what about him? He said, he also is a muqtadi' because he argues in matters of the deen. He argues in matters of the deen. And arguing in matters of the deen is a bid'ah. Is a bid'ah. So what, what message does Imam Abu Hanifa give us now at the moment? He tells us that refrain from arguing at all costs, especially in matters of the deen. The opposite of what, about what, what Muslims are doing today. <coughs> Muslims today, their, 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 their favorite topics is to argue about the big masail in the deen. Without any knowledge. This is very dangerous. Very dangerous. And this particular argumentation that we see going on between us, it's all because of jahal. As a matter of fact, Jahal is still uh, a, a lean, too much of a lenient word. It's worse than that. We have Jahal Murakkab. Jahal Murakkab is when a person thinks he knows but he does not know. That's even worse. A person who is Jahil, who is ignorant, is a person who submits to the fact that he has ignorance of a topic, so he's going to refrain from that subject. But is that us? No, that's not us. We are people who think we know, but we do not know. And then we argue as if we do know. That is called Jahal Murakkab. And this is the big dilemma of our era. Okay? So, Imam, Imam Al-Ghazali Rahmatullahi Alayhi gives us advice. He says, he starts up with the words of Rasul Sallallahu Alayhi Wasallam. And now the beautiful, beautiful advice that our Salaf al-Salihun gave us is, still, is things that we have to take to heart. We have to try to practice it. That is what ilm is. Ilm is nothing until you practice it, then it becomes something. Otherwise you are just another book or maybe a CD. Huh? Or you can go even smaller, you can be a, a SD card. And many of us think it is allowed to argue and to debate. Especially debate. Wait, well, I'm just debating with, just a minute, I'm just debating with him at the moment. As if it is something sunnah, as if it is a sunnah. 
Just give me a sec, I'm just debating. As if it is something that is highly encouraged by, by, by our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Huwa shay'un manhiyun anhu. لا تماري أخاك ولا تمازحه ولا تعده موعدا فتختلفه. Our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a person when he spoke everything he said was jami mani, meaning all encompassing, all encompassing and full of wisdom. لا تماري أخاك. Our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said tumari comes from comes from the word mira which means to argue. Don't argue with your brother. Wala tumazihu. And also don't jest and joke with him. Especially when he is a faithful brother. Sometimes you can jest and joke. Depends on your relationship. But generally, the, the rule is not to debate and jest with your brother. Wala tu'idhu mawaidan fatakhtalifu. And don't make an appointment with him and then you, you don't follow up. This is the nasiha of beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. And our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in our second hadith, which Imam Ghazali quotes in his Ihya al-Mudin, he says, Adharu al-mira fa'innahu la tufham hikmatuhu wa la tu'man fitnatuhu. Stay away from mira, our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, at all costs. Because nobody can understand the wisdom behind it. Mira is argumentation. What is the wisdom behind argumentation? Okay. Wala tu'man fitnatuhu. And the fitna that comes out of an argumentation, none of us are secured against it. The fitna can turn into, it can turn into murder, it can turn into battles, it can turn into massacres, into genocide. No? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Man taraka al-mira wa huwa muhikun bana buniya lahu baytun fi a'la al-banna wa man taraka al-mira wa huwa muttilun bana lahu baytun fi rabt al-janna Subhanallah Also a hadith of Abu Lawad Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the merit of Staying away, out of, uh, staying away from argumentations. Whosoever refrains from debating and arguing, and he, and he is right, is not wrong, is right, and it is his right to voice his opinion, but he refrains from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala builds for that mu'min a house in the highest part of Jannah. Huh? Now we know our, the, the Jannah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it in seven tabaqat, seven tabaqat, seven levels. The highest of it is Jannatul Firdaus, the Jannah that our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw. And the reason for that is because it brings unity if you refrain from following up an argument. It, 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 can, it brings unity between brothers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unity, brotherhood, ulfa, mahabba, love and affection for your brother is one of the greatest forms of ibadah. One of the greatest forms of ibadah. Just to love a brother. Abdullah ibn Umar said, if I were to stand the nights in tahajjud, to khatm al-Qur'an, and fast the complete dahr, the entire year, fast every single day, and I don't have a brother that I am connected to, I will fear for my state the day of Yom Al-Qiyamah. Just one brother. That is why Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a mu'min, if he has four, pe four people here, we're not talking about just any person, a salih man, a person who who performs his namaz, his salah, regularly. A person who loves the deen, who practices, tries his best to practice the, the sunnah. If such a person witnesses that so-and-so is a salih man, four of them, then he's of Ahlul Jannah. 
Abdullah bin Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned this in hadith sahih. The Sahabah said, Ya Rasulullah, what about three? Rasul sallallahu said, three, ma'alish. If three people witness that so and so is a man of salah, of piety, he is Allah of Jannah. Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, what about two? Subhanallah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If two people witness for so and so that he is a man of salah, a man of piety, he is of Ahlul Jannah. The Sahaba radhiallahu alayhi wa stopped it there. They said, If we had to ask Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one, he would have said one. Subhanallah. So that tells us that we need to build relationships. Haven't you heard of the word of the saying? Religion is relationships. Haven't you heard of that? It's a common English word. English proverb. Religion is relationships. It's not only about ibadah. Because a man has prayed his entire life, fasted every single year, the entire month of Ramadan, completed Hajj how many times, and Umrah how many times, the day of Yom Al Qiyamah, if he said something bad to somebody, if he uttered something or abused somebody, committed backbiting about somebody, slandered another, the day of Yom Al Qiyamah, all of those ibadah will be taken away from him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is the muflis, this is the bankrupt person. The ulama say, based on that particular hadith and other hadith, such as the man who comes to the door of the Kaaba, he comes to the door of the Kaaba, and he hangs on to the multazam. And he says, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, give me, give me, give me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Malbasuhu haram. The clothes that he wears is haram. What he ate is haram. وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ What he drank is haram. فَأَلْنَا يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكَ How can I answer that? Right? So what is the point if a fasi comes, he harms so-and-so, he slandered so-and-so, abused so-and-so, physically or verbally, it doesn't matter. He, he, he did this one in and he, you know, the day of Yom Al-Qiyamah, our ibadah is not going to count. No matter how much they are. That is one of the things that the ulama kept on reminding us when we were studying. That don't think that your tahajjud and your khatmul Qur'an and your psalm and your sunnah this and sunnah that is going to really benefit you. Yes, it is good if it's going to benefit you and it's going to be very good for you if your relationships with other people are on a good standard. On, a, on, on the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see it be. So, we have to rethink the way we behave with one another. We have to rethink what is the meaning of this argumentation because we have quite a lot of them. Quite a lot of them. I don't know if you've seen some of the Arab channels. You know, there's lots of amongst the Arabs. SubhanAllah, if you think the Arabs are you know, Allahumma uh, salli wa salli wa barik alayhi. They are now, uh, they forgot about jahiliyyah. Think again. The Arab khutaba and ulama say the Arabs of jahiliyyah are better of the Arabs of our modern era today. No? Subhanallah. If you watch some of the Arab channels, they bring two of the opposition parties. Okay? The debate starts off very nicely. Both of them give their opinion why they are right and why they should be followed or why they should be given the, maybe the, uh, the, the post, right? And then eventually, like about 15 minutes afterwards, each one has a chair in his hand and they're beating the crap out of one another on live TV. Subhanallah. This is what's happening. And they put it on TV for everyone to see how the Muslims debate. And then you turn the camera towards the West. And then uh, you have people who have intense grudges for one another. And you look at how they debate. It is uh, yes sir, no sir, 
I beg your pardon. You know, beautiful respect, you know, that they have for one another. You know, regardless of the fact that they are big enemies of one another, they still have respect. David Cameron at that time and uh, President Putin, you know, I could almost, you know, uh, see the tension in the air when it was about uh, the Syrian uh, situation. But there was respect between them, which we didn't see amongst the Arabs. And the Arabs are obviously, they are, our, they are the standard bearers of this deen. We're looking back to them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, like our alim uh, in, uh, in South Africa told us, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave knowledge to, to the Arabs um, and when they did not appreciate knowledge uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it from the heart of the Arabs which is Mecca and Medina and he took it to Egypt and in Egypt when the knowledge was not respected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it away from there and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it to India The India, bigger India region, subhanAllah. And that's true. Huh? So, what does Imam Ghazali say further on? وَعَنْ أُمْ سَلَمَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَنْهَا قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ إِنَّ أَوَّلَ مَا عُهِدَ إِلَيَّ رَبِّي وَنَهَانِي عَنْهُ بَعْدَ عِبَادَةِ الْأَوْثَانِ وَشُرْبِ الْخَمْرِ مُلَاحَاتُ الرِّجَالِ uh, Sayyida uh, Umm uh, Salama, Ummul Mu'mineen, she, 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 she relates a hadith, she says the first thing Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught me and told me when I came into this deen, or when I made bay'ah in the very beginning, because remember Umm Salama, she's one of the first ladies to enter into the deen of Islam, because her husband was of the Sabiqoon al awwaloon uh, into Islam, one of the very first people to, to embrace Islam. The, what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa told me is uh, uh, is not to worship idols, number one. Stay away from drinking wine. Third one, don't argue with your husband. Don't argue with your husband. No? وَقَالَ أَيْضًا مَا ضَلَّ قَوْمٍ بَعْدَ أَنْ هَدَاهُمُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أُوتُوا الْجَدَلِ We mentioned this particular hadith. People never went astray, uh, astray after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them guidance except that it was because of argumentation. لَا يَسْتَكْمِنُ عَبْدِ حَقِيقَةُ الْإِيمَانِ حَتَّى يَدَعَ الْمِرَاحِ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُحِقًا A person's iman is not complete, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, his Iman is not firm and complete until he leaves off argumentation, even though he's right. Even though he's right. How, do, how is that possible? Uh, how does that uh, create, or how, does, uh, how is that the sign of, of true Iman, Haqiqatul Iman? Because the person, when he sees an argument, uh, somebody arguing with him or somebody telling him something that he's not pleased with, he sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in action. This is how the awliya, uh, Ridwanullah alayhim, used to see uh, mankind. If somebody comes to you and tells you off, what's the natural state of a man? He's going to get infuriated, he's going to defend himself, and he's going to fight back. But the state of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they see this coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Ghazali gives us, uh, he relates that Abdullah ibn Zubayr used to say, لا تجادل الناس بالقرآن فإنك لا تستطيعهم ولكن عليك بالسنة Abdullah ibn Zubair gave us very, very, very good advice here. You know, especially for us Muslims today. We like to quote ayat from the Quran, thinking that we uh, use it in its right place. No? 
The, we have to know that there are many interpretations of the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim, amongst them, they have different interpretations of some of the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? For us, as ordinary Muslims, it is for us to follow what the Jahabila, the great ulama, mentions in their books of tafsir on the ayat. Before we use the ayah, we can't just take the ayah, the literal meaning of the ayah, and then use it. So Abdullah ibn Zubayr said, don't ever argue using the ayat of Allah. Because you are using actually kalamullah in a very, in a haram situation. How can you do that? No, it's very, very wrong. The ayat have many interpretations, and one of the problems that the, 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 the you know, the Ummah al muhammadiyah they struggle with a lot of things, but this is one of the things that they really, really should be aware of. It. That is, when they read an ayah, they imprison themselves in that ayah, as if there is no other ayah. Okay? There might be another ayah that explains this particular ayah in more detail. And it so frequently happens that an ayah gives a meaning, but it's not complete. You'll find the completion of the meaning in a different surah, in a different ayah. No? Or maybe you'll find the explanation in the sunnah. For example, uh, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلَ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدًا فِيهَا Whoever kills a Muslim mutaammidan on purpose for jazauhu, his reward will be the Jahannam Khalidan Fiha. Eternally he will dwell in it. Oh, subhanallah, this kufr. A one who kills a human being or kills a Muslim is kafir khalas. The ayah said it is kafir. The one who kills a mu'min is kafir. Yet our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in many a hadith that if a person murders, commits, act, uh, commits the act of murder, he's not a kafir. He's committed a kabira of the kabair. But he's not a, he's not a, he's not a kafir. Subhanallah. So people, what, when they start imprisoning themselves, this is a sign of jahil. Brother, have you heard of this hadith? Have you heard of that ayah? And then it's as if they don't want to know this ayah. But it's, a, it's the Qur'an speaking to them. And this is a level of kibr. A level of kibr, when the haqq is given to you, you reject it. Now, this is a form of kibr. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained kibr like this. Batal al-haqq wa khamtu nas When the haqq comes to you crisp and clear, you reject it. This is kibr. Wa khamtu nas To oppress others in order so you may rise. This is all forms of kibr. So then, don't ever use uh, the Qur'an to argue with people, but rather use the Sunnah. Because the Sunnah is easier to understand. The Sunnah is wider, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's more uh, digestible, the meaning is easy to understand. وَقَالَ عُمَرِ بْنَ عَبْدُ الْعَزِيزِ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ مَنْ جَعْلَ دِينَهُ عُرُضَةٌ لِلْخُصُومَةِ أَكْثَرَ التَّنَقُّلِ To be honest, this particular uh, saying of uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, I'm still struggling to understand this. I'll move on. وَقَالَ مُسْلِمْ إِبْنِ يَسَارِ إِيَّاكُمَ الْمِرَافَ إِنَّهُ سَاعَةُ جَهْلُ الْعَالِمِ وَعِنْدَهَا يَبْتَغِ الشَّيْطَانِ زَلَّتَهُ Jadal for an alim is extremely, extremely dangerous. An alim should never ever enter into jadal debate or argumentation. Because... It is here when uh, students of knowledge always have a particular school of thought that they follow. Or maybe if they are from the same school of thought, they come from a different madrasa. Okay? Shafi, Shafi, but different madrasas. They sit together. It starts off. As a conversation, it leads into an argument, it starts with a debate, it goes into an argument eventually, eventually, there's ikhtilaw between the two. But if from the same school of thought, same madhab, 
No? They follow the same Imam. And this is frequently happening. This is how Shaitan enters in. This is what uh, Muslim Ibn Yasar warns every single alim about it. If you enter into an argument, Shaitan is waiting for the Zalla. It slip. Right? He's waiting for the slip. Ha! Huh. He said that. So he does what's worse to the opponent. He says, tell him this. And then he goes to the other one and says, tell him that. And then we become like a football between the legs of the, of the young being kicked around. This is what happens to, to ulama sometimes. Not all the time. But debate amongst the ulama sometimes is fruitful. Uh, Abu Ishaq al Isfarahini, I've read in his. Uh, Abu Ishaq al Isfarahini, Abu, Abu Ishaq al Shirazi, Rahmatullahi alayhi. He's is one of the, the, the big Shafi scholars from the Khurasani side. The mother of Mama Shafi is a Khurasani side and it's got the Iraqi side. The Khurasani side. Abu Ishaq, uh, uh, Abu Ishaq uh, al-Shirazi, he uh, <coughs> was very strong in, in debate. So what used to happen in those days, when there's a janaza of a very eminent scholar, the ulama, the ulama used to come together to pray janaza and to show the respects to the family and to the alim himself. So when there is a platform on which um, there are many ulama. The people used to ask the ulama, debate for us, debate. Right? And uh, one of the, uh, the people that used to, one of the ulama rather, that uh, frequently entered into debates was Abu uh, Ishaq al-Shirazi. Uh, and one particular janaza, uh, Imam al-Haramain al-Juwaini was there. He was young. And Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi was very old. And the people encouraged them, debate, debate, debate. And there was a debate. But why did the people ask them to debate? <clears throat> so that they can get knowledge from them. When they debate, the people would sit with a pen and a book ready to write down the knowledge of fiqh. And the ulama knew that. And after that, it was a handshake, and the janaza was done. Subhanallah. Nowadays, I don't think it will happen. You know, there will be a couple of janazas on top of the janaza. <laughs> no, also, Qala, uh, he also said, uh, um, sorry, this is Anas ibn Malik, radiyallahu ta'ala an. He said, Al-Mirai yuqsi al-Qulub wa yurithu al-Dagha'in. If you argue, it hardens the heart and it creates enemies. You create for yourself enemies. So stay away from argumentation. And this is what's happening amongst the, uh, the Ummah al-Muhammadiyya. They are one Ummah, follow one, one Nabi. They, have, uh, they worship one Allah. And still... The Jordanians have something against the, the, the Saudis, and the Saudis have something against the Kuwaitis, and the Kuwaitis have something against the Saudis, and it just goes on and on and on. Allah Ta'ala straighten us out with, with, uh, with not so a uh, hard stick, but a gentle, gentle lesson, inshaAllah Ta'ala. Qala Bilal ibn Sa'ad, idha ra'ayta rajul lajujan, مماريا معجبا برأيه فقد تمت خسارته. and this is why we are in a big and utter state of loss. خسارة is because of this. بلال بن سعد said إذا رأيت رجلا if you see a man لجوج لجوج is continuously arguing, fighting his case, fighting his case. مماريا arguing endlessly معجبا برأيه and also he is conceited. His opinion is the only opinion that's right. فَقَدْ تَمَّتْ خَسَارَتُهُ Know that this person's uh, destruction is complete.
this person's destruction is complete. Sufyan al-Thawri said, Saf man shi'ta thumma aghdibhu bil mirab. Make friends with whoever you want. And if you want to be, if you want to break the friendship, well, sometimes you know, you know, sometimes you have a friendship that you want to just stop. This is guys, just a nuisance now. Start arguing with him. That is what Sufyan al-Thawri said. Start arguing with him. And then you'll see the guy will stay away. So, there are many, many more sayings that are really, really important for us to go through, but we'll stop there and then we'll go quickly to the definition of Mira, and this is very important. We need to know when does an argument start, because sometimes we, we, we have brothers and sisters, we have families, we have wife or wives, or we have uh, fathers sometimes that, you know, sometimes upsets us, and elders that upset us. Committees in the masjid sometimes you know, get upset with one another. When does an argument start? Now, Imam Ghazali has given us the had, the definition of an argument. When does an argument become an argument? He says, وَحَدُّ الْمِرَى هُوَ كُلُّ اُعْتِرَاضٍ عَلَى كَلَامِ الْغَيْرِ بِإِظْهَارِ الْخَلَلِ He says, it is every counter-argument upon the words or the speech of someone else, or, some, or somebody else. Somebody has said something, and then he counter-argue, or you rebut, or you refute, or you protest against what he is saying, by revealing in that person's speech, Either you reveal in that person's speech mistakes, either verbal mistakes, okay, verbal mistakes, or you, 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 you say, you know, he's either used words incorrectly. This is how an argument starts. Don't say it like this, say it like that. Wa imma fil ma'na, or in the meaning of the person's words. <coughs> وَإِمَّا فِي قَصْدَ الْمُتَكَلِّمِ Or in the intention of the person who spoke to you. So there are three things. When somebody says something and it comes across to you incorrectly and we want to rectify, that's the beginning of an argument. Okay? That's less. When somebody says something the meaning comes across in a particular way. You understand from what he or she said a meaning and you want to refute that meaning. This is when an argument starts. Or somebody says something, the words are perfect, the meaning is perfect, but you look at the intention of the person, why they have said that. Now all three stages or all three uh, instances, if one were to just do what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, and that is taghaful. Naam? Kathratu taghaful. This was the state of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to ignore many of the things said, many of the meanings that came across wrong. He used to ignore them. And also the intentions Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa never ever touched them with a stick. A man's intentions is his own thing. Right? So, when somebody says something to us, think about those three uh, instances. If a word comes across to you, and the person has said the words in, you know, rearrange these words in such a way that it sounds very awful, you come and say, well, you know, brother, no, or sister, no, you know, what you have said doesn't make sense. Just leave it. If you know what they meant, then just leave it. Or the meaning came across as a, uh, a meaning that is there to, uh, to incite hatred or maybe uh, jealousy or whatever. 
ignore it. The easiest way to stop people from annoying you or harm you or hurt you is to ignore them completely. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, this is nasiha of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our, our beloved Rasul. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. wa sallam. Naam. Fasda' bima tu'mar wa a'rid anil mushrikeen. Hold firm on to what Allah has commanded you to do and to preach. Wa a'rid. And just ignore what the mushrikeen are saying. And what did they say? They said many hurtful things to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he just ignored. No? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after that, Inna kafaynaka mustahzim. Mustahzim. We will take care of the people who make istihza to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No? So these are the three things that we need to be aware of. Imam Ghazali says it beautifully. He says, uh, don't look at the person's words, the way they order their words. Don't take the meaning serious. Don't look at the intention of the person. And these are obviously when one has got, gotten the, uh, a negative vibe from the person. But if something is positive and it's uh, beautiful, you know, uh, we, 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 we accept everything that is beautiful and good from another person. And uh, we leave it all there. Tarkul <coughs> mira and to refrain from mira is to refrain from inkar from opposing that person's uh, words or the meaning or the intention. فَكُلُّ كَلَامٍ سَمِعْتَهُ فَإِن كَانَ حَقًّا فَصِدْ فَصْدُقْ بِهِ وَإِن كَانَ بَاطِلًا أَوْ كَذِبًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مُتَعَلِّقٌ بِأُمُورِ الدِّينِ فَاسْكُتْ عَنْهُ Imam Ghazali tells us, gives us beautiful advice, beautiful advice. He says, <coughs> every single speech that's been given to you or every single conversation that you had, that it was haq, it was true, accept it. Accept it. Wa in kana batilan, if it is batil, if it is not true, okay, it's something completely false, it's a lie, it's a myth, it's <coughs> completely you know, uh, false. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مُتَعَلِّقًا بِأُمُورِ الدِّينِ And it was not connected to matters of the deen. Also ignore it. Just be quiet. How many arguments do we have on matters of the dunya? Huh? Okay. Young men have big arguments over which car is the fastest on the track. Big argument is not matters of the deen. Okay? Then you get, you know, elders having arguments on matters of Allahu Alam. It's all dunya things. And it just turns the whole conversation and the environment and, uh, and the majlis into complete, you know, war zone. Why? Okay? So, it is important that we try to. Uh, implement these things. In the dunya we argue, ma khalas ma'alish. You know, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yadagafalu an yani an aghlab al-kalam. One of the, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the character of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is even Sayyid al-Nas mentions in his Nur al-Uyun. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to just ignore so many things. So many things. And I think we will stop here inshallah ta'ala about the topic of argumentation uh, and perhaps next week insha'Allah ta'ala we will finish it off and uh, box that particular chapter off there is another chapter that Imam Ghazali will enter in insha'Allah ta'ala hopefully we can add that one on to, to, to our next encounter and that is Khusuma Khusuma now just a brief introduction to Khusuma Khusuma is also a type of argumentation but it is in contractual matters contractual matters for example inheritance for example custody of the kids it's an argumentation but a different kind of argumentation there's an agreement between two people they can't come to a, 
contractual agreement, they start arguing. For example, insurance, claims, for example, uh, you know, business uh, transactions, okay, and following through with, with uh, the conditions and so on. Many, many, many argumentations and many, many disputes, we call them disputes, amongst people on contractual matters. Inshallah, we'll leave that topic. Inshallah, for next time we meet, I think I've said uh, enough about argumentation. Uh, the, the had, the definition of argumentation, this is the most important thing that we need to take home today. Okay? It is upon us to make change so that the society can change. Individually. If you listen to the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, إن الله لا يغير بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Look at the ayah. Allah does not change a community. A community does not change until the individuals in that community change. So if we want change in a, the bigger community, where does it start? It starts with me and you. No. You start with me and you. So, people then will speak a language without uttering a word and others will learn from them. So that is our uh, sincere contribution in the line of da'wah. Is the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam in our homes and from our homes into the community. And the community will be a transformed community if we do it sincerely, if we do it correctly. No? But how can we if we don't have the knowledge? And this is why we have these lessons. This is why we try to repeat the words of Imam Ghazali. Who have changed or which have changed so many communities over the thousands of years, or thousands of years, the thou hundreds of years that has passed. As a matter of fact, a thousand years has passed since the demise of Imam Ghazali. He died in 500 years after Hijrah, and today we are well into the thousand after, the millennium after that, uh, that demise of the great, great Ali. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whose hands lies all the fear to grant each and every one of us to fear, to guide us on the straight path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make uh, us uh, uh, the, the, the true standard bearers and followers of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to incorporate his, uh, his life into our, in our living rooms, into our bedrooms, into our kitchens, into our societies. There's nothing more that we want except to be like him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease the path unto uh, uh, emulating Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah.